Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Thank you to all the sponsors of our health equity series, including Deloitte and Algorex Health, who are represented on today's panel. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Deloitte, Dr. Kimberly Myers. Thank you, Eddie, and hello, everyone. Good to be with you all today. I think we have a great panel plan for you focused on uh, really getting more out of your health equity programs. As each of you knows, this past year has been unprecedented in many ways, and there has been renewed focus on health equity given the pandemic, um, given the conversation we are in about equity in general, the national conversation, and also the priorities of the Biden administration. And so I am super excited to be able to moderate this panel today and have this time with you. By way of introduction, my name is Kim Myers. I am a principal at Deloitte. I'm a scientist by training with a PhD in virology. And I wear two hats at Deloitte. One is as the diversity equity and inclusion leader, for portfolio uh, or for the government and public services practice, which is a practice of about 15,000 people. And the second is as a leader of a portfolio of clients in the health and scientific space, both federal clients as well as health and science nonprofit organizations. I am joined today by some amazing panelists that I want to give the opportunity to introduce themselves uh, as well as share a little bit about what brings them to this topic, why they are interested in and passionate about this topic. And so I'll ask Jacob, Gretchen, and Michael to join us. And I'll pitch to you first, Jacob. Can you just say a little bit again about yourself, your background, what draws you to this topic? Um, of course, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm Jacob Luria, the president and co-founder of Algorex Health. Um, the, the background that drew me and my firm into this topic was really working with uh, Medicaid managed care organizations, provider delivery organizations um, who were trying to understand how they were sort of supporting their communities and were they actually achieving some of the equitable components um, and didn't have the data to understand where they stood today. Um, and so being able to start the conversation where we live in a world of resource limitations, um, how am I doing now? And realizing that in-house data was, was largely insufficient to those discussions. Um, so really provide a supporting resource of understanding sort of data at scale uh, to support those individuals and organizations that we work with. Great. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Michael, will you introduce yourself? Hello, Mike Curry. I'm the Chief Health Equity Officer here at United Health Group. And I guess you would say my entire career has really been a preparation for this role. I've been in population health management ever since I graduated from college, essentially. I started in a local health department, in the state health department, um, while I finished off my MPH. And then I was working in health care. Well, actually, then I started working as sort of the wellness director in what used to be a Fortune 500 company at the time. And then I moved over into health care in a regional health care company uh, in a role that was really centered around account management, but it had a lot of population health management associated with it. Then I moved over to United Health Care, um, similar role as that regional company, and then was elevated to this role of the health equity guy or person here at United Health. So um, it's my background is a culmination of public health and population health experience with business acumen. You put the two of those together and I really, Kimberly, get the very fortunate reality of living out not only something that is an interest and a passion, but my job. So if I were to write my ideal job description, it would literally be the job that I'm doing. That is amazing. Thank you for that, Mike. Uh, and Gretchen, please introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gretchen Wartman. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Vice President for Policy and Program of the National Minority Quality Forum. Uh, the forum is a not-for-profit research and advocacy organization 
based in Washington, DC, and our capabilities include data analytics, policy analysis and advocacy, issue-specific alliance development, and community-based provider quality and improvement initiatives. The mission of the forum is to reduce patient risk by assuring optimal care for all. The forum's vision is an American health services research delivery and financing system whose operating principle is to reduce patient risk for amenable morbidity and mortality while improving quality of life. Now, how, how I got here is over uh, almost 50 years of working in health, health services um, uh, administration and planning, uh, either in the federal government, state government, or in the private sector. And uh, I, I would say where my experience meshes with the mission of the National Minority Quality Forum right now, sort of the particular synergy, is I think what uh, uh, Kimberly spoke to in her introductory remarks, which is what we've been seeing for the last year and a half at this point, I'm not quite sure, um, is unprecedented. And what's an unprecedented is the degree to which it is visible and the degree to which it is affecting in a, um, uh, a tangible and negative way every single aspect of our health services research delivery and financing system. I think what is of particular concern uh, and, and the reason the National Minority Quality Forum uh, is engaging to the degree we are, is that it was predictable. If we had paid attention to the data that we have, the experience that we have, what we know to be the way the system parses information and access to care, then this was predictable. So that being the case, even though we're downstream a tad, a bit, from uh, the immediacy of the COVID-19 crisis. We are upstream from the next crisis and there's an opportunity now to, to step back, to get up on the balcony, I think they like to say it, at Harvard and some other places, and take a look at our entire system, assess our entire system and determine where we need to realign it consistent with supporting the health and viability of not only the human beings who are dependent upon the system, but of the business sectors who must be supported in order to assure that the system can function well. So, thank you. Thank you for that, Gretchen. And you know, you really hit upon uh, some really powerful things. So, first of all, this is not a new issue. It's not a new challenge. There is renewed attention and focus on it. Uh, but there is uh, not a lot that is new here. The problem is old. Um, and indeed, uh, you all have been engaging this problem and your organizations have been engaging this problem for a while now. I'm curious to hear, and maybe starting with you, Gretchen, and then, then going around, with some specificity, what, what are your individual organizations doing to drive change around the topic of health equity. And I think one of the th great things we have here is that you represent uh, very different pieces and components of the ecosystem. So uh, payers, nonprofits, uh, private sector. And so I'm curious just to hear what your organizations are doing uh, to address health equity with some, with some broad strokes. Well, I would say that, um... Everything we do, everything we've done uh, addresses some aspect of health equity. What is new for us, other than the fact that uh, we now have a construct that is focused on health equity and what I define as essentially the cumulative effect of the efforts that we've all been engaged in as, as we've attempted to uh, uh, eliminate, identify and eliminate health disparities or, or mitigate health disparities, health inequalities. But the end point of that, all of that activity is now being defined as equity for uh, 
all users of the system. And so what we're doing is, I guess, twofold. One is communicating a message where we have an opportunity to do so, that it is incumbent upon our society to assure that the system is focused on reducing patient risk rather than simply mitigating financial risk associated with um, uh, providing services. And I say simply, and I know it's not a simple thing, so I don't like to think that I'm that naive, but the mitigation of the, final, of the financial risk is a, um, an essential component of assuring that we have a system that can uh, continue, that can um, uh, uh, sustain itself as a business. Um, what has tended to happen that I think we've all seen uh, is that the mitigation of that risk has far too often taken the uh, form of finding ways to constrain access to services, delay access to services um, uh, in a way that minimizes the impact on the patient. Um, and so we're, we're communicating that message and then very specifically in order to create a, um, to bring all of the different actors together who uh, have a, um, a stake in the outcome, whether it's payers or uh, uh, pharmaceutical research and manufacturing companies, organized patient advocacy, organized physicians. We created an institute for equity in health policy and practice, and we're trying to bring people to the table so that we can begin to have those conversations, those upstream conversations, so that five years, 10 years, 30 years from now, we're not facing an even worse societal crisis uh, as it relates to these kinds of threats to our health. That's great. Thank you. Michael, would you uh, elaborate on the same question, just some of the initiatives and programs you all are engaged in? Sure, sure. And the work of around health equity is not new to United Health Group. We've been at this for well over a decade. I've been in this role for a little bit over 11 years, and there was activity happening before I assumed this role. So, you know, for 15, 18, close to 20 years, we've been doing various things associated with advancing and achieving health equity. One of the things I want folks to really understand and really a level set on awareness is health equity is the top of the mountain. That's the overall state or overall goal we all want to get to. And in order to get to this state of health equity, this place of health equity, there are all these various puzzle pieces, some larger than others, but all these various puzzle pieces that go into advancing or achieving health equity. And I'm pleased to say that at United, we have worked in every single one of those puzzle pieces, health dis pure health disparities identification and remediation work, social responsibility work, also known as philanthropic support, community-based support. There's our um, supplier diversity work, making sure that suppliers that we use, uh, we're increasing the diversity of those suppliers. DNI work, diversity and inclusion work, implicit and unconscious bias training, health literacy work, work to better identify social determin determinants of health. All of those various puzzle pieces that go along to advancing and achieving health equity, we have work in. Again, just like any other organization, or institution that's working on this work, there are gonna be some areas that are more robust than others, but we have a focus on all of them. We have work effort in all of them and we have output and outcomes and initiatives in every single one of them. Jacob. Um, absolutely, and I think that, uh, Gretchen, thank you so much for talking about sort of de-risking some of the components. And I think that we're starting to, to see this um, in our work and the, the primary elements that, that we're bringing together and trying to support sort of equitable distribution of services 
um, equitable understanding of patient and member risk across the healthcare environment um, is really focused on how to understand and how to get to an actual true baseline of what is going on within my service area. Um, we have a number of organizations that we work with, and this is probably true for, for everyone who's either attending or on the panel, uh, where we are trying to understand our current state and understand how are we doing today um, based on in-house data or patient reported data through um, surveys that are administered at the point of care. Um, and we see that that type of process of asking patients as they come through our doors, using that to understand where should we either align services um, or use that at an analytic level to understand where delivery is, um, is ultimately a, a proposition that is lacking. Um, that we have found that type of approach lends to sort of the constrainment of services, Gretchen, that you mentioned, right? I, I, we're somewhat sympathetic to health systems and health plans because there are limited resources in the world, right? We still haven't met the, the health plan that wants to provide all of the social determinant supports that it can out into its membership and out into its patient base. Um, but what we found is that the, the current approach of creating screening activity and creating that type of gate that you must walk through my doors and you must have the trust in me and an institution of a health system or a health plan to raise my hand and say, I need help or I have this type of challenge um, has been much more of a perpetuating issue than understanding how to make changes or think about a redistribution that is in a much more equitable fashion. Um, to give you an example, we worked with um, a, a sort of group of pediatric practices. Um, and what we realized is they were going through a resource limit of where should we deploy 25 community health workers? Um, should we put them sort of in this area or this area? And they looked at their internal data um, and what they ended up doing was placing almost all of those workers in areas that um, were much more affluent. And when we looked at some of the data that we were able to, to understand from, from various sources of consumer marketing activity, from digital activity and whatnot, um, we were able to see that actually the responses through survey data, right, which is sort of goes through that bias door of trust that you're here to help me, right, not just create challenges for me by reporting needs, um, led to us placing more resources in areas that were doing better. Um, and being able to actually step back and say, I only have limited resources. Where are some of those pockets that I can provide additional support and how can I do that more intentionally um, is really how we're deploying those activities. Um, to give one last example here, if I'm a large Medicaid plan with 100,000 members, I may only see 30,000 of those members through a phone call, a clinical encounter, a utilization activity, through the lifeblood of data that comes through my organization as a health plan. And so I'm effectively blind to those members that I have financial accountability for. And if I'm going to think about services allocation, um, I think that's one of the challenges that we see, Gretchen, when you talk about constrainment of services around why that happens, right? If I don't know anything about those individuals because they're blind to my legacy and traditional systems, I don't know how to count that or I actually don't know how to service those types of broad-based populations. Um, and so that's how we are trying to open the door on data um, and create a more sort of true baseline. Again, never perfect, right? But better than sort of through self-reported or only through sort of claims of analytics and clinical utilization data, um, which we see sort of predominant today. So the, those are such powerful comments and uh, from, from each of you, it's, it's actually hard to know where to go uh, next because I think there are a ton of directions we could go in. Um, could probably be having this conversation uh, all day. Um, but I am curious to know, and, and Michael, this is maybe a question for you. Um, how do you encourage organizations and systems to embrace the concept of, uh, of health equity and to embrace equity as central and core to their work, not adjacent to, uh, but as central and core to the work and the mission. Uh, Kimberly, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty easy pivot back to the quadruple aim. And all of us, and the majority of the organizations that I have an opportunity to speak to uh, are associated with the healthcare industry. And all of us in the healthcare industry 
have some level of appreciation and orientation around a quadruple aim. So improving the patient and provider experience, um, improving outcomes, and lowering costs. And you could point to any particular puzzle piece, those puzzle pieces that I talked about a moment ago. You could point to any one of those puzzle pieces and their contribution to any one, if not several, of those elements associated with the quadruple aim. Um, what is relatively new, I get asked a question quite often, you know, Mike is the health equity guy, all of this awareness and um, sort of new appreciation for the impact and benefits of health equity. This is all kind of new conversation and new stakeholders wanting to be involved. And actually, Kimberly, the answer is that's not quite true. And the reality is, I never had any difficulty, Kimberly, engaging in a conversation or getting folks to want to engage. And these are the words, I want everyone to pay attention to the words. I never had any issue getting folks to engage in a conversation and a discussion around the importance of health equity, what different uh, pillars or activities or puzzle pieces associated with that health equity that they could begin, that was never an issue. What all of the unfortunate realities of 2020 have brought to bear is um, this notion to act and to urgently and immediately act. Now, as someone rooted in population health management and health equity, this is an opportunity to do more. Am I disappointed that it was all of the unfortunate reality of 2020 that prompted this orientation? Absolutely, there are many of us that are disappointed it kind of took all of that to drive this very sincere orientation to act. But nevertheless, it's an opportunity to do more, accelerate, and expand the work. So very simply, whether I'm talking with someone out of the finance department or I'm talking with someone that's a chief clinical officer, if we just line up as the pillars for action, those four areas of the quadruple lane, we would really be hard pressed, Kimberly, to not be able to identify those kinds of activities, action steps, initiatives, whatever it is we wanna call them, that drive towards the quadruple lane, but also support and advance health equity. It's amazing. So you, Michael, have uh, mentioned a couple of times the, the puzzle pieces and, and Jacob and Gretchen, you, you've also talked about um, just the focus on outcomes. Um, I'm curious to know, how do we define and measure success of the programs and the things that we're doing? And maybe, Gretchen, I'll, I'll pitch to you first. Um, just curious to know your thoughts about that. And, and then Jacob would be curious to know your thoughts here as well, especially as a, as a data guy. Um, just how do we define and measure success? Um, I don't know if I'm getting ready to answer your question or not, but the um, so fo following on Michael's comments, I think one of the, um, as we've all had this really traumatic experience uh, for, the, for the last six months of, of being confronted with, um, some people define it as the failure of the system or of a, of a broken system. Some others are starting to say, actually the system isn't broken. What we have seen is the output statements of the way the system is actually uh, uh, designed. Uh, and so for me, the uh, sort of following on what Michael was saying, what we're encouraging people to do is now that they're having the conversation, looking inside their organizations to determine how they transition from what I'm calling gesture to practice. And that practice uh, requires uh, a 
I think, a forensic examination of internal processes that are generally only visible to those who are inside the system. Some of us, are, some of us in, in this country are just beginning to understand that there even is a system that is supposed to do certain things. But a, a forensic examination of what's gone on in the past in terms of the algorithms and methodologies that are used that govern the way the business operates. And some of them are in AI. We've seen examples of that, or we've seen headlines associated with where some of those uh, have failed um, and are, that are defined as um, sort of um, unintentional biases. Uh, within uh, clinical research, uh, uh, the uh, inclusion criteria for clinical research is a methodology that's used to decide who's included and looking, examining those to determine where those, um, where the biases are that constrain that access or steer access to particular segments of the population just for the denominator of the research so that you can begin to then have uh, statistically significant uh, um, the results in the, in the numerators um, is work that the different segments of the system need to do inside, inside. So my, um, uh, I, I think a, a metric of success for me, for the National Minority Quality Forum is assuring that, or taking steps to help assure that those structural uh, 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 the structures that enable the bias that result in unfortunate outcomes are redressed intentionally and explicitly because it will not happen simply because we've become aware of them or, or are excused because we're, they're defined as unintentional. I think, the, I think the sophistication of our science, be it economic science, be it legal science, be it um, um, uh, 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 clinical science, enables us to predict the outcomes of the behaviors of the system. And if in an intentional way we do that, and then redefine it before it's uh, uh, foisted onto <laughs> the American public that is desirous of being able to trust the system, but is constantly getting messages that suggest that perhaps blind trust is, is not the way to go then I think that would be a measure of success. And I'm saying it in that way because there's no single point, it's a process. If we, if we met, if we achieved equity by eight o'clock tonight, we'd have to continue to monitor because things change constantly. These external forces to which the system needs to react change constantly and we need to have processes inside to assure that as we respond, that equitable, uh, that value of equity continues to uh, take priority, have priority. I don't know if that's the answer to this. Jacob, go ahead. Uh, absolutely, and I think that um, Gretchen uh, sort of both personally and sort of as a company completely agree with sort of the elements that, that you're talking about here. Um, when we think about some of the measurement activities, um, we don't believe there's a right answer today um, around what those actually are. And much more when we think about right, it's about um, be willing to look um, about how does some of the things that we look at, do we look at quality measures and look at the disparities that might exist by race and ethnicity? Do we look at how sort of service delivery and sort of um, call response times uh, relate to each other based on socioeconomic class by tiers of income. 
Um, and it's actually being able to, to say, how are we doing? Um, and then start to make meaningful progress against those. But um, we see the, the first step on a lot of this is just ask the question and bring the data to bear on um, what is our performance to date. Um, the, the other component that, that I think you mentioned around sort of um, bias within sort of machine learning and AI algorithms is something that um, is, is being unpacked sort of daily and weekly right now. Um, and the, the way that sort of we've at least started to, to look at that sort of within sort of both the existing components that drive just general health plan and health system operations um, is compare the performance of some of those algorithms, the selection criteria, um, against purely socioeconomic tier and look at income and say, does, does this model look exactly the same um, in terms of identification versus just an income measure? Um, and more often than not, that leads to organizations saying, hey, wait a second, we, we actually need to look a little bit deeper here. Um, and we believe that sort of there's a responsibility of a lot of the data and modeling providers um, to potentially sacrifice model performance for explainability. Um, to release the underlying weights on these activities for um, we are ascribing vehicle ownership sort of X amount of weight, whatever those activities are and whatever those elements are. Um, because when we talk about trust, right, trusting an algorithm blindly has been proven to be a, a poor way of moving forward. Um, being able to actually unpack an algorithm and say, what is it identifying and why is it identifying um, to start a lot of those conversations. Um, so I hope that sort of as it moves forward, that that can lead to a modicum of how should we measure success in, in a more sort of structured framework. Um, but for now, it's really around maximizing explainability, maximizing sort of performance against things like pure economic tier um, by different geographies and be able to, to start looking to say where might we have biases that um, may be unintentional, um, but are very much avoidable um, at the same time. Thank you for that, Jacob. I, I would encourage uh, attendees, if you have questions, please drop those in the Q&A. We will, we will leave some time at the end to answer those questions. Um, and so if you have questions, please go ahead and drop those in the Q&A. Um, I'm just curious in, in hearing each of you talk to this, um, and Jacob, you kind of hit upon it a little bit. Um, how do you know you're targeting the right population? Um, you know, we talk about health equity and, um, you know, sometimes it becomes this, this big term where we kind of assume what we mean and we assume we know who we're talking about. Uh, and I'm not sure that we always do. And so I'm curious to know, how do you know that you're targeting the right population for your health equity programs? And this is a little bit tactical as well. And so um, maybe I'll pitch uh, Gretchen to start us out and then and Michael would love your comments on this as well. Um, I think where, where your question leads me is to uh, the, I would say, renewed uh, attention that's being paid to social determinants of health. And um, the concern I have is that an assumption is being made and, and actually the, the way the language is being used, I find a little uh, challenging. The notion that somehow certain populations have certain social determinants of health and other populations do not is extraordinarily, uh, I think, um, disingenuous. Uh, and so the, and, and it suggests to me that social determinants of health is being used as a, um, um, I'm going to break on the word. Uh, it, it's simply used, being used to replace uh, as alternative language to uh, minority or black or other kinds of categories. So I, I, I think one of the things we need to do if we're going to really pay attention to in, in, in the United States, what these social determinants of health or equity or inequity or unhealth, what they do uh, or how they affect us is that we've got to collect data on everyone, okay? Not just on the people that, as you're saying, we somehow assume that we automatically know who we're talking about, 
Okay. We assume that we need to look at the Medicaid population more than the uh, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield population. Um, start examining the impact of this multi uh, 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 sectorial system on everyone. And then we might be able to see, I think what we, uh, I think will also help us which is that the assumption that somehow your education and income are uh, have great carry greater weight than your phenotype, which we also know to not be true, depending upon how you how and when you present to the system uh, and with what particular um, um, uh, diagnosis codes. Um, so I, I, I don't know that we yet know how to, uh, other than those that we, uh, populations that we know have financial challenges uh, in terms of accessing the system. Uh, if you have financial challenges associated with accessing the system, by definition, you're going to have challenges further um, as you attempt to access services within the system. But this is a much more nuanced conversation than that. And our society has evolved far beyond where we were in, I would say 10 years ago even, but okay, uh, in the um, mid part of the 20th century uh, when uh, the conversation was about uh, whether the data collected should be black, white, and other. And we were patting ourselves on the back for even collecting the, the black, white, and other data. So I, I think there's work to be done there, but we can start with the data that we have. We can start with what we know to be, to what we can um, um, uh, predict based upon the experience of the, um, that we've had with the system in terms of once again, what the outputs of certain behaviors of the system will be. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't think I can answer that question as simply as you wanted to, because I don't think we can focus on any uh, particular uh, population if we're trying to achieve equity, if we're trying to achieve equity. Yeah, and Gretchen, I actually think that is a phenomenal answer and a powerful answer because I think that is the that's the component that we often miss when we uh, when we assume we know what we mean by health equity and we know the populations we're targeting and and I think that assumption is all often uh, wrongly made and um, Mike or, or Jacob, anything you all want to um, add to that. Jacob, if I could, so, uh, again, I'm going to go back to the foundational comment earlier. Health equity is that overall state, and then there are all these puzzle pieces that help drive towards equity, health equity. And I even want to be very clear about using the word equity versus health equity, because equity, big E equity, can take on all sorts of different areas. There can be social justice reform, there can be police. I mean, there are all sorts of things that fall under big E equity. Health equity is one of them. So I'm keeping my comments very focused on health equity. Uh, but when we're talking about um, understanding the population that's best served, it depends on that puzzle piece. If the puzzle piece is around health disparities, then the analytic data to look at various health measures stratified by demographic data, age, race, gender, geography, to identify health disparities at a local or market level. That's what you do. That's foundational to doing health disparities work because it's never a matter of if those health disparities exist. It's always a matter of what, where, meaning geographically, what population, and what order of magnitude does, does it exist, not if. If we're talking about social responsibility or philanthropic work, then it's communities. We're looking at big, broad communities that um, would best benefit from whatever the philanthropic effort is, whether it's housing, 
whether it's uh, athletic equipment, whether it's supporting school systems in an area, then you're looking at big community-based areas, not geographic specific members or individuals accessing the healthcare. If you're looking at diversity and inclusion, that's more inward looking at your employee base and how you hire and promote and all of those things associated with that. When you talk about training, um, unconscious and implicit bias training for a healthcare company of our size and scope, are we talking about clinical um, individuals or non-clinical individuals? Because even though the concept of the training will be the same, the uh, components of the training will be specific and tailored to the population that you're, in trying to, that you're trying to influence, improve behavior around. So my summary answer is, it depends on what puzzle piece, or should I say the puzzle piece or pieces that you're focused on will help drive and influence the population or populations that are best served by the work that you would do. Jacob, did you want to add something? Uh, in full agreement with Michael um, here and some of the comments, Gretchen, that, that you made around um, making sure we're looking at whole populations to understand and, uh, and not making the assumption that only specific communities or specific geographies have, have issues um, and sort of have inequities to be resolved. Um, I think the, the area that we've been focusing on as a proxy measure, right, not a perfect measure, um, is trying to increase the number of individuals who can gain support um, with the same dollar investments. Um, and, and the reason that we focus on some of those activities um, is to, to try to tease out, are we moving upstream or not? Um, oftentimes when we think about social determinant interventions, um, they're coming very late in the process. They're coming when there is such a significant challenge that that individual is raising their hand extraordinarily high um, to say, is, is there opportunity for support or help here? Um, and when we look at trying to move things upstream, we want to say, can we um, have similar clinical engagement, survey-based outcome activity um, with a lower unit cost reaching more individuals? Um, and starting with that sort of foundational analytic, Michael, that you referenced, um, but trying to move as much upstream as possible um, to create that sort of broader impact for a broader population. Um, but that we, we haven't found a better measure. I <laughs> would be curious if anyone, um, if the attendees or other folks here would, would sort of talk about something else, but um, having that sort of opportunity to have wider scale um, while having sort of either better or common types of, of clinical outcomes um, is how we've started to look at, are we focusing on the right populations or are we focusing on the right sort of targeted selected cohorts? I mean, I, 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 may I? Yes, please. Okay, I think what Jacob and Michael are speaking to, which is ex extraordinarily important, is that depending upon the role, the, the, the um, uh, that the, the organization that the business is in, uh, plays in the overarching research delivery and financing system, the, the interventions for which they can be accountable and the metrics of success will be different, more, more specific, more precise. And as Michael said, depending upon uh, the, uh, the groups within the organization, uh, to whom they're speaking, what they message and how they message it is going to vary. For the National Minority Quality Forum, where we have um, uh, sort of the challenge and the uh, um, opportunity to do is look at the entire um, um, system and get a sense of how it's working. And so individual metrics are important and must be uh, uh, relevant to the different business sectors or they, they, they will abandon them. But I think, Kimberly, I also heard you asking how as a society are we gonna decide when we got there? <laughs> when, first we need to define what, what there looks like and feels like as a society. Make sure we've got societal metrics that uh, are inclusive of all of the different roles that the business sectors play and monitor them 
constantly. And so I, I would say that, um, say for the, um, whether it's the payer sector or the uh, pharma, pharmaceutical and, and, and um, biotechnology sector or the, um, there have to be, as we look forward, we have to work to develop business models that support what they do well and what we want them to continue to be able to do well so that as a society, we move forward. Um, but I think we need to find some way also, or and we need to find some way also to create this more collective vision of what societal, this equity looks like. And Michael is right in the sense that, I mean, it's, he's looking at it through the health lens, but the social determinants of health conversation is broader than the health lens. It is what back in the eighties they call the medicalization of social problems, okay? Everything, education, income, residence, the type of work you do, all of that affects one's ability to create a state of health and maintain a state of health. And so I just think the conversation needs to continue and we need to make sure that we not, I think revert to what has, I, I tend to see as sort of our, everyone's comfort zone and function within our, uh, our silos and do what we do well and not uh, confound our work with issues over which we feel we have no control. Because I think there needs to be a more, in fact, I'm confident there needs to be a much more collective, if that's a safe word to use, collective response to what we saw this past summer because it not only affected those patients, where the, the crisis we began to see on TV, and I'm pointing to my TV because it's on 24 hours a day, uh, is how it affected healthcare workers, how it affected the ability to the, the um, uh, brick and mortar um, uh, 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 sites of care to respond to the demand, how it affected every aspect of our society was stunning and was terrifying. But I think it also says that there's nothing to go back to, not in total. We can't do anything that will take us back to what caused last summer to happen, but we can learn from last summer what parts of our system worked, like the ability to create, a vac create vaccines much more quickly than anyone assumed they knew was, was possible. And make that a standard part of the way we do business. So I, 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 um, I think every perspective here is valid, but there needs to be a collective societal commitment to moving this forward because we're on, we're on our way off the planet, whether anyone wants to acknowledge it or not. And yet we're struggling with each other down here um, with issues that can be addressed. I have, I have absolute confidence that our, the brain power of humanity is capable of defining this issue in a way that it can be addressed and addressing it in a way that is supportive, supportive of the uh, biology, as my boss likes to say, of all of us. Yes. Thank you for that. So I want to jump to the, the questions that folks have, have uh, asked. Uh, we've got a few here. And, you know, picking up, Gretchen, on some of your comments, and, and maybe I'll pick, pitch to, to Michael and Jacob to expand upon this, but uh, an individual asked, who are some of the key partners in any social determinants of health or health equity program? And I think it picks up on sort of uh, some of Gretchen's comments around uh, this is a societal challenge. So uh, any specific thoughts um, uh, to that particular question? Well, I, I'll just reiterate, um, Gretchen is spot on. 
around the fact that these social factors, um, social determinants of health, and for those of us who've been doing this work for a while, there's nothing new about social determinants of health. They've been around for a long time. They've been called social determinants of health for a long time, um, but they are, or can be, but not necessarily, but they can be, but the stakeholders and partners are going to be specific to the community that you're focused on. So in one area it could be different community-based organizations, community action councils, it could be violence prevention, it could be housing, it could be food support. So your stakeholders are going to be dictated by what social factors or social determinants of health are most pressing in a particular community. Jacob, did you want to add to that? I completely agree with Michael. I'd say as secondary stakeholders, um, and maybe this is a, as a reformed consultant, are some of the, the internal finance folks. Um, I do actually believe, Gretchen, you alluded to this, that the business models, um, I think, actually do exist today in terms of making these productive investments um, and being able to show how there's uh, we've seen some organizations refer to investments in social elements and from the health systems and health plans that are not always sure that their responsibility to, to make these investments um, as pure cost centers. Um, and just in, in our experience, we've not seen that to be true. Um, that helping individuals, meeting them where they are um, can be a good business decision and actually have um, return in the short term um, on these types of investments. So I, I would not I'd sort of think of very much as a secondary component. I think Michael's right around community first, um, but there is sort of a, a financial component here that I think is, is worthwhile to, to address. Great, Jacob, I'm gonna pitch this next question to you as well, which is with the increase of adoption of digital health experiences, does this make it easier or more difficult to improve health equity practices? And are there any best practices you are seeing? Uh, I think the answer is both. It becomes easier and harder. Um, I think that similar to the addition of a digital or non-digital service um, to a health system or a health plan, if done with intentionality, um, there's greater opportunity for scale of digital solutions. Um, but without intentionality and without understanding the current state, um, it, there's significant opportunity for those digital services and digital offerings um, to perpetuate current state. Um, and be sort of exactly the same type of distribution and utilization as we see with, with other activities. Um, so would focus on sort of intentional deployment um, of digital services. It's an opportunity given some of the low unit costs on those elements, um, but not as standalone sort of um, replacements for, for doing the real work. Great, anyone wanna add on to that? Great. Thank you, Jacob. So next question uh, from, from you all. So can you provide any advice on how to help organizations become more centered on health equity? Also, what strategies do you recommend for activism toward anti-racism in healthcare organizations? And Mike, I'm gonna go to you for this one. It, it's a um, sort of a two-fold process. Um, so I can walk you through some of the thinking that we have internally. And when I've talked with others, I've offered this same sort of guidance and input. First is the organizational mission. What is the focus of the organization? Do you deliver healthcare? Do you provide healthcare support? Is it more of um, a community-based organization, a regional organization, a national organization? So first is really getting grounded on what your organization does and what your organization is supposed to do and deliver well. That's number one. Two then would be the populations that are served. Normally there's multiple populations that are served. And once you understand those populations, now we just get into basic population health management 101. And um, Jacob will appreciate this because this goes right to the data. Then you start understanding based on what you do uh, or what you're supposed to do well and what you're supposed to deliver and the populations that you're serving, now you look for the gaps. And what I would call, you know, gaps is more of a negative term. I'm gonna call them opportunities for improvement. And as you identify those opportunities for improvement, that is how you start building your strategies, your plans, your objectives, your goals, 
your interventions, your initiatives, whatever it is you want to call them. Um, that's how you start building out your strategy to address those health disparities or opportunities for improvement that are specific to populations. What makes health disparities um, or what makes work health disparities focus is a population focus. If there's purely a focus on a health measure or a quality measure, that's a quality improvement initiative. The moment that you then um, focus and stratify and identify a or several populations that uh, can be improved, whether it's by age, gender, race, geography, disability status, sexual orientation, you determine the demographic stratification that's going to take place. But once you incorporate a population basis into your health measure improvement work, that then defines health disparities mitigation work. One more question from the chat. Thank you, Mike. Um, can you please explain how hospitals or individual practices can frame pathway for health equity? What are they doing now and how, how it would help in reducing health equity gaps? And I'll open that up to, uh, to the panel. Anyone have any specific comments? Well, I, my, my first comment would be that I know the American Hospital Association is doing an extraordinary amount of, of visionary work in uh, this regard. And I would, I would refer the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, that uh, questioner to the American Hospital Association. But I, I would also say that I think part of a, the challenge as it relates to these different biases is assuring that if we're trying to eliminate disparities um, or, or create equity, to assure that the reference population uh, takes us where we want to go. And so the, it, it sort of gets back to Kimberly's question about assuming we know who's affected and therefore we're making also certain assumptions in the, a lot of the work that I see that is constantly comparing uh, black people to non-black people, Hispanic people to black people, all of us collectively who are not, who are not defined as uh, Caucasian or non-Hispanic to Caucasian non-Hispanic populations with the presumption being that the experience of those Caucasian non-Hispanic populations is the ideal or is the best that can be done. And where I'm encouraging us to all find a way to go is, as we've been hearing, let's look at where the science can take us and have the, the science be the reference population. And then we can take a look at all populations to have a sense of where the gaps are between the populations that we're looking at and the possibility of the science, where the science is and where we know the science can go. So I, I think there's a, um, I hear what Michael is saying and I think it's valid, but our, my, my concern is that we are narrowing our, narrowing the possibilities by creating these kinds of, um, um, these comparisons between one population and another, and none of it is really moving society forward to what's possible given where we currently are with science. Thank you for that, Gretchen. So we are at the top of the hour. Um, this has been an amazing panel and an amazing discussion. Um, I think the thing that uh, I'm really left with as we close this out is, um, is that we must keep momentum here. Um, and um, I, I think we really have to think about that in ways that are strategic um, and in ways that are, are big and, and widen the possibilities as, as Gretchen noted. 
uh, because we, we've got a tremendous opportunity here. Uh, but I think like many, uh, there's a fear that I have of, you know, this being something that we lose momentum around. And so if I could leave uh, all of our panelists and all of our attendees with one thing, it would be uh, keep momentum uh, around this topic. With that, I'm going to pass things back to uh, Eddie, uh, while also thanking our panelists uh, and our participants today. Thank you.